fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, you've made it back in the House of Mystery and I don't know why. Uh, but now we're up for the interview, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the book, The Garden State Parkway Murders, and it's a cold case mystery. Uh, this one just uh, was released January 20th of 20, uh, not too long ago, and uh, the author is with us on the line. His name's Christian Barth. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you very much, um, both of you, for having me. I greatly appreciate it. So... Garden State Parkway Murders. Um, what got you into writing this book? A distant childhood memory. When I was about 12 or 13 years old, I was driving north along the parkway in the back seat. Uh, my parents in the front seat. Uh, we had always vacationed at the Jersey Shore, and we had just driven past the Ocean City exit. And as we were driving along, I recalled my mother saying to my father, uh, words to the effect of, they never found out who killed those girls, did they? And I said, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? And my dad started to tell the story that they were found you know, along the side of the road near that mile marker just north of Ocean City. Um, and I sort of you know, compartmentalized the memory until 1993 when I had read in the Philadelphia Inquirer where Bundy biographer Richard Larson um, had learned that Bundy was in the area at the time, and he was pretty much convinced that the murders of Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry um, in 1969 on Memorial Day uh, were, in fact, Bundy's first killings. And that really uh, got me into it. Um, from there, I wrote a short story about it and then wrote a book called The Origins of Infamy, which was a fictionalized version of the case, um, starting with Bundy on death row and from there back to Philadelphia and New York City and and obviously back to Florida. But Bundy was, uh, and this is the part that, for whatever strange reason, the pro strange reasons, the producers of these specials on TV tend to gloss over. Uh, I was just making notes before I spoke with you all. They always seem to start at either 1974 or September of 69 when he met his girlfriend at the Sandpiper Tavern. But in 1969, Ted Bundy was attending Temple University in Philadelphia while living with an aunt in a suburb of Philadelphia known as Lafayette Hill. Um, in 1986, he made a series of remarks to a psychologist named Art Norman on death row, speaking in the third person, saying, you know, he was, this Bundy speaking, of course, quote, he was in the area at the time, and he was at the Jersey Shore, and he trailed some women along the beach, and he wound up meeting a couple girls, and it was the first time that he did it. And Armin Norman, of course, uh, held that close to his vest until Bundy was executed for fear of, I guess, violating the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and right the day before uh, Bundy died, psychologist Dorothy Lewis, um, in his second-to-last interview, gave Bundy basically a clean slate to talk about whatever he wanted to, and without any encouragement, Bundy started to go into the whole Ocean City um, part of his life again. And I'm actually quoting from the book, and he says, uh, In the spring, I went to Ocean City, Ocean City, New Jersey, Bundy told Lewis, and just hanging out at the beach and looking at the young women, trailing them around, uh, etc., etc. Um, and he sort of emphasized that this was the time he first tried to abduct a woman along the boardwalk there, but said he didn't kill a woman, which is obviously different from what he said earlier, but very fascinating the coincidences because there were two women killed at this time and everything seemed to add up. Uh, another thing about Bundy that people tend not to know um, and that I reveal in the Garden State Parkway murders after speaking with one of his relatives at length is that 
he had spent a lot of time down there in his youth because he had family uh, not only in Seattle but in Philadelphia. Um, so he spent a lot of time down there. So, you know, to the extent that serial killers tend to operate within certain confines, you know, that certainly lends itself to the argument that, that he had time, if he in fact did kill these girls, to scope out his area, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's sort of the version as to, as to how I got into it and, and Bundy's involvement. Mm. So now, what exactly happened to these girls? And, and do we know the series of events that led up to their death. Yeah, so they were staying in Ocean City on a ninth, in a Ninth Street boarding house owned by uh, Mr. Sybin. Uh Ocean City at the time uh, was and still... ...marketed itself with the slogan, uh, the greatest, America's greatest family resort. Um, people would go there... Um, before the casinos opened, of course, and sort of took away the business. They'd go there, the young people, and stay in these, these boarding houses, um, go to the beach, stay there at night, but then they would go and party right over the bridge in a town called Summers Point. Summers Point had a number of bars, one of which was known as Tony Mart's, which was famous for being the place where the band, uh, you know, with Robbie Robertson, etc., uh, got their start when they were known as Levon and the Hawks. Apparently, the the story was that they were playing. They were the house band of Tony March one summer, and and uh, Bob Dylan called and asked them to join him on the tour, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so the girls were there Memorial Day morning, um, and had intended to leave to go to Pennsylvania to join Susan's parents um, for the drive down to North Carolina to see Susan's brother graduate from Duke University. They left at about 4.30 in the morning from the boarding house, went over the bridge uh, near the bars, and went to the Summers Point Circle. There's a very famous diner there, the Summers Point Circle. They were last seen eating dinner there at about 6 a.m. They left, um, went north, and their car was found about two hours later along the side of the road in the Garden State Parkway, uh, abandoned seemingly about two miles later and 45 minutes after they had eaten by a, a patrolling state trooper he called in the license plate number to the state of pennsylvania but a wrong tag uh, was relayed back to him he had the car towed went on a fishing vacation that weekend and when he came back he had learned that the girls in fact had been reported missing but he just didn't know it at the time um, and that's when the search began immediately um, you know hands and knees everyone in the air was flooded it was all over the newspapers that the girls were missing and about 15 minutes into his search, a highway worker named Elwood Fonts uh, stumbled across the bodies of both Susan and Elizabeth about 200 yards in from mile, mile marker 319 on the parkway. So uh, what did the, what did the um, police think at the time, back in 1969, uh, what did they attribute the murders to? They didn't. They, there was no motive, and that, that was the thing. These girls were from very affluent families both of them really, really affluent. Um, Elizabeth was from Excelsior, Minnesota, lived in this beautiful, now, you know, several million dollar house on, on the lake up there, and Susan's uh, parents were, were both very successful. That, that was part of the, the conundrum. There, were, there was no motivation. They went and uh, tracked, uh, went through Ocean City and Summers Point, all the bars, and tried to find anyone who knew them. And, and really, no one had run into them. The few that had had nothing but glowing things to say about them. So they couldn't come up with any sort of motivation as to who would want to harm these girls like this. Well, did we have any previous connection with Bundy to them? Um, that's that's what we don't know. Uh, that's one of the great mysteries of this thing is we don't know whether in 1969, uh, you know, Ted Bundy had been one of the persons questioned, nor do we know what prompted him to make those remarks on two separate occasions regarding Ocean City. So there was nothing connecting them as far as we know to the case back then. But again. Uh, one of the lingering questions is, you know, did the New Jersey State Police have Ted Bundy as a person of interest in 1969? Is it still in those files? That That's what we just don't know. Now, were the girls sexually assaulted or tortured or anything um, extra other than just... Uh, they were not... Uh, no, they, they, there was... I mean, it depends on how you characterize you know, sexual assault. 
I, I, I heard nothing indicating um, that they were uh, had been sexually assaulted. Um, that it was um, uh, they were stabbed obviously to death. One of the girls had been found uh, nude. The others with her clothes, their clothes, her clothes on. Excuse me. So there was no evidence of sexual assault, but because of the three days between which time um, they were found and, and, and the car had been found alongside. There was a lot of decomposition, so they could never say that they were raped. My opinion is that they were not, um, because no DNA, at least as of 2011, um, that's the last time I had spoken with the police and got any information out about them, had been found. So I don't believe that they were assault, sexually assaulted. Mm. How long did it take you to put this book together? Christian, still there? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so long, how long did it take you to put this book together? Uh, almost 10 years. Um, I had gathered a bunch of research and preparation for the first book, The Origins of Infamy, and then really did a deep dive into it afterwards. Um, starting at about 2009 or 2010 when I interviewed everyone, uh, obviously, um, about the case. Every detective that was still living at the time, some have died since I've interviewed them. Um, so that's about how long it took. I went to libraries, I looked up investigative files, and so forth and so on. And it, it took a long time. I interviewed, as I said, a lot of people that have never been interviewed about the case before, namely uh, Ted Bundy's aunt, uh, at length, and um, I email corresponded with one of his cousins. Um, and it was during that time period where it really started to dawn on me that a lot of the stuff that had been said about Bundy you know, wasn't, in fact, true, or perhaps there was an alternate version of events, namely um, regarding his birth. Now, we all know he was born in Vermont, and his mom was single at the time, and so forth and so on, but... One of the strange things that I've read is that, and it, it, it must have started back with Ann Rules, the stranger beside me, was that Bundy was uh, allegedly, if not abused, at least had been exposed to um, a lot of violence um, at the hands of his alleged temperamental alcoholic grandfather. I don't know if either of you have read The Stranger Beside Me, and all the stories about him are that this guy was a raging alcoholic and would swing cats by the tails and throw his three daughters down the stairs and what I read was entirely inconsistent with that uh, uh, so that was one of the strange things that I guess prompted me to look even farther into Bundy's origins um, and, and, and see where it just seems so bizarre that there's these two inconsistent narratives and everything I found is different from that which has been written about him and about his grandfather. Of course, when he was born in Vermont, I guess several months after, they moved to a town called Roxborough, Pennsylvania, which is where his grandfather, Samuel Cal, and his grandmother uh, had lived. And that's, that's where he stayed until age four. And then they moved, I guess, to Tacoma or, or to, to Seattle and um, Ted's mother, Louise, got married to Johnny Bundy, and et cetera, et cetera. But that's always struck me as odd, as I was able to find out an information, and it was not overly difficult to find, but what do mm. I know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that just seems strange to me. Well, I think that I, I've come across that in many of the cases. Um, and I also think that what happens is um, something comes out like what Anne, Anne Rule's book did. And a lot of other writers and documentaries and shows you see, they follow that. Like they take that narrative and they just build on it and use that. Uh, I don't think they go outside of that. So, Yes, I think uh, you're, you're exactly 100% yeah. correct. In fact, I had gotten a call uh about six months ago from a person who has since produced uh, a documentary and wanted to know it was all about the origins of these serial killers and wanted to know what I knew about the Ocean City thing. And I said, look, I'll, I'm going to tell you these things, but it's not what you're used to hearing. You know, with regards to him, 
I don't know if they were looking for a convenient answer or confirmation that you know, Bundy was abused or witnessed this, these abusive acts. What I found is entirely different from that. And, you know, she listened to me politely, but that was the last time I heard from her, and I haven't seen the, uh, the documentary, so yeah. we'll see. I have a question, if you will. I want, want to, I want to sort of touch on the forensics of this. Being an ex-police officer, I, I saw the quote from, uh, I guess it was John Divell or Divell, the police, yes. uh, police chief. Uh, he said that he had a very good working knowledge of chemistry based on where the bodies were left. Why did he think that? He, well, well, here's the thing with Divil. Divil, when I interviewed him, he was in Ocean City, so they didn't have, the Ocean City Police Department didn't have jurisdiction over the matter. It was found on the, the Garden State Park where the bodies were, so it was the New Jersey State Police, and it was Atlantic County. Atlantic County divides the line between Cape May County, where Ocean City is. So he said that he had nevertheless had, had you know, spoken with people and, and visited, etc. So he was privy to some knowledge, and it was very, very hot that uh, that time of year un, un, you know, uncharacteristically so it was in the 90s and if you know anything about the east coast especially the middle atlantic states new jersey it really doesn't get that hot until about july or august so here you have the last day of may and it was into the 90s for several days so he felt that uh you know the humidity uh and the, the temperature tended to accelerate the decomposition um, and and these 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 factors um sort of contributed to the decomposition and eroded whatever evidence uh, that may have been more available at the time to them. That, of course, combined with the fact that there was the three-day lag you know, between when their car was found and their bodies were found. Now, do you know, did he think that maybe the suspect waited until this heat? Uh, this interests me that he made this statement. Uh, does he think that maybe the suspect, or, or do you know that maybe the suspect waited until there was enough heat to go with the no, other no, element? No, I, 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 didn't, I didn't gather that from him. Okay. It was just a matter of happens, happenstance, I think, is what he was emphasizing, that the, these factors, it was a perfect storm of, of things that happened, which which caused the, uh, you know, the, the acceleration um, to occur. But it was, it was these, the, this combination of things that allowed... Again, you know, allowed the person to get away, and there not being any evidence left behind that could be attributable to him. All they found was, uh, to the police, two things. There was a diver's watch found at the crime scene, as well as Susan's glasses. Uh, and they went to great lengths to try to find to whom the, uh, the diver's watch belonged. Um, and about 2006, uh, I got a fax. These are back in the days when faxes preceded emails and came right across the fax and a secretary gave it to me and said it's for you and as a woman said i understand you're writing about these murders i know who did this blah 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 blah. and i and i go into this this suspect this prime suspect in great detail in the book his name was ronnie walden and um this person said that she met him down in fort lauderdale in spring break in 69 noticed his watch and it was a specific type of watch. It's a Ben Roos brand. The model was called a Belfort Sea Diver. And on the face of the watch, it said 17 jewels. And when she told the police that she thought she knew who had done this, the police brought her in and questioned her about it. And this was before a picture of the watch had made it to the newspaper. And they kept asking her, was he wearing any jewelry, this guy? Was he wearing any jewelry? She said, no, no, no. And they said, well, was he wearing a watch? She said, yes. And they showed him a picture of her a picture of the watch and she said that's it i know because i saw the 17 jewels and he was wearing it and i'd never seen jewels written on a watch face so uh from there the police i guess got an apb or whatever the term was and they went out to garfield county colorado uh where this person this ronnie walden had fled after coincidentally the murders at the jersey shore and when they got there, uh, a few hours before their arrival, this Ronnie Walden had tried to hang himself in his jail cell, which I thought was disturbingly coincidental. Um, and he tried to hang himself. And again, there's, there's this theme of strange coincidences throughout the story. 
he tried to hang himself in the very same jail cell where Ted Bundy had escaped through the hole in the ceiling fixture back in 1977, eight years after the Garden State Park where he murdered this, of course, before he went to Florida State and, and killed the four coeds down there. So, so when people read the book, um, what do you want them to come away with at, at, after they read the book? Like, what is it? What is it you want them to get out of it? Well, I want them to to, to certainly read it and, and say uh, the the obvious. Ask themselves, you know, why hasn't there, there's so much stuff here? You have these these uh, three people who were living um, in quest, living in you know in the Philadelphia and questioned at the time. Um, you know, we have Ted Bundy impliedly admitting to the murders. Another serial killer, Gerald Stano, living a few miles from him and coincidentally lived next to uh, Bundy on death row for a time. They knew one another. Um, you have these things going on. I would, I would like to see people ask why or you know, have the police investigated the old list, the old files. Um, to see if there was any connection um, between these guys back then. I understand that you know what things are what they are now, but it'd be really interesting to see in retrospect whether either of these guys had been questioned back then by the state police in '69. Um, again, Gerald Stano, who murdered 33 people on death row, admitted to the Garden State Parkway murders in 1982. And so, you know, was he, was he, you know, the, the, the police downplayed his confession. They felt it was coerced. He was doing it for notoriety. He wound up being executed as well. But I would like to see these, I would like to see a reader ask themselves the question, you know, have the police examined these coincidences and have they re-reviewed the files from back then in light of what I've set forth in the book? Well, what do you, what, so what did you find out about Stano? Like, what was, what's your opinion on him? He, here's the strange part. Stano, you know, there were a lot of people that said his, his, his confessions were, were coerced down there. Uh, I talked to other guys, other detectives within the Daytona Beach Police Department who said, no way, this guy killed every girl he said he did. But another of the strange coincidences is that um, one of the suspects, the 18-year-old, was questioned at length. Uh, after uh, the murders. He was the first person they were interested in. And I find out after the fact, years and years later, from a person within the Pennsylvania State Police that this 18-year-old had an acquaintanceship with Gerald Stano back in 1969. And I had two other police officers tell me that Gerald's younger brother, Roger, who died in 2016, was in fact questioned by the New Jersey State Police for the 1969 Garden State Parkway murders as well. Uh, I, I absolutely couldn't believe it. Like, You've got to be kidding me. This has actually happened. I, I talked to a couple of people. They were interested in a serial killer's younger brother. They said he was down there at, at the time of the murders. But, again, what happened? What happened? You know, there's, there's these loose ends that I just don't have any idea, but I've tried to explore them and come up with uh, plausible scenarios as to what happened, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the things I'd like to, uh, again, for the reader to consider. And you know, as, as far as Gerald's culpability, Gerald used to, uh, his M.O. was he would tend to kill prostitutes and others. Some of them weren't prostitutes. They were normal, you know, girls, college-age women, sort of like Ted Bundy tended to gravitate toward. He would attack them or you know, approach them in a car. Uh, he would stab them. He would bind them. And when he disposed of their bodies, uh, they were always found covered in leaves and sticks with the clothes stacked neatly nearby, very consistent with how uh, Susan and Elizabeth were found, as their, Susan's especially body was found with um, you know, leaves and sticks, and her clothes were piled neatly nearby. So he's a very, very viable suspect. But again, it goes back to not only you can say, well, he's a he's a serial killer, and he was um, full of you know what, and, and saying these things. But what about his brother? His police telling me his brother was down there and questioned by the state police. So, hmm. well, it, uh, what? So, it, do you think that he confessed uh, out of? Um 
like real like he really did it or do you think it's well possible? it's hard to say I, I did come across uh, some exhibits to an old brief um, it was part of a motion to suppress his remarks as being coerced by the police department and there were transcripts of what he had said to this uh, this police chief and the police chief had been in touch uh, right after this uh, right after this interview with Stano. He'd been in touch with the New Jersey State Police, and he asked Stano, you know, I said, "What about these murders up there?" And he said, "You know, they're different. They're different because one of the girls was tied up, and that's sort of not like you." And Gerald immediately expressed fear as to what was going to happen next, and he didn't say, "I didn't do those. What are you talking about?" He seemed very fearful. Now, whether that was due to the circumstances of him being you know, questioned at that point, I don't know. But he certainly didn't deny them when he was asked. And then, of course, in 1982, he told the same detective, he gave him a written confession, but he was off in time and place. He said, well, it was 1972 or 1973, and two girls on the Atlantic City Expressway, um, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, they said it was, he said it was a sports car, I believe, but that sort of is inconsistent with the 1969 and it being on the uh, Garden State Expressway. But to the extent that serial killers conflate facts and truth and so forth, I did interview uh, the detective who had interviewed him down in Florida, and he said that was very consistent with what Gerald did. He was remembered a lot of things, but he was always off on time and place and dates. So, you know, we just don't know. Hmm. So now you mentioned about... Um um, FBI serial killer profiling that could help identify the killer. Um, what did the profile turn out to be? Okay, I conducted my own amateur profile. Oh, okay. <laughs> In addition to speaking with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a serial killer expert. And uh, the way the bodies were found, again, with one of them being... Uh, and this was this was the holdback. I didn't find this until several years. Found out this until several years ago. The holdback with one of them, either having, and I was never able to confirm. I had two people tell me that one of the girls had a bra tied into her hair. The other one told me that they were bound to a tree. So you know, do that's that. Those are mo's and signatures consistent with with a serial killer. However, this is again one of the things that has fascinated me about the case. When I talked to a serial killer expert, I told him, you know, these occurred basically in broad daylight because six in the morning on May 30th in 1969, sunlight was, sun, I'm sorry, daybreak was at 529, so it was bright out there. And there was also a car that was parked behind the girl's car with three boys in it that had fallen asleep. And once I told him that, he said, there's no way a serial killer would do that because the last thing a serial killer wants is to get caught. So when he saw that car, he would have taken off. But you know, how does that jibe with how these girls were found? There was also another holdback. There was jewelry found on one of the victims, expensive jewelry, heirlooms and diamonds and so forth. And the serial killer, if it was that person, didn't touch them. That's also consistent with them. They don't rob victims. They come there to do what it is that they do, and then they leave the bodies. And in this instance, again, there seemed to have been a signature and the fact that they didn't take anything, no diamonds, no nothing, and just, just fled the scene. So you, on the one hand, you have yourself thinking it had to be a serial killer. On the other hand, you're like, you talk to this expert who says, no, it couldn't have been a serial killer. So yeah. the profiling, uh, it, it's fascinating because you get a lot of people say, well, serial killers aren't this always white, single, lonely men in their 20s. That's that's not true because look at Wayne Williams and the Atlanta killings, but for the most part, I think it's about 75% of them are white men, and they are in their 20s and 30s, and they tend to operate within a three-state radius. So say New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. They seldom go outside. People like Bundy, um, sort of an anomaly. They didn't, they didn't fit into that, but most serial killers do operate within, that, within those confines. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. What's what's the response from the Ted Bundy community? I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, strong opinions uh, in that area. So, uh, did you expect backlash? 
I didn't I didn't infiltrate it yet. That that's the crazy thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sort of I, I, I I'm very grateful um, for hosts like yourself that are interested in, in, in delving you know, below the surface. Uh, I, there really hasn't been any exam because the book hasn't been out long enough. But there really hasn't been any backlash. I, I don't think there would be backlash. It's not any real controversial controversial position I'm taking. It, it's fact. I, I research this this stuff. Um, you know. So he was here and he made these admissions. And again, he, as far as I could tell, he wasn't witness to any abuse as a child or any sort of influences like that. It just this is just this is just something that that the media has taken and and run with thus far. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I just know how they are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so um, do, do you plan? Uh, wh- why do you think this case hasn't been solved, or do you think the police are just it's an old case and they don't want to follow up? They don't have the time or manpower, or is there something else? A lot of those factors. Um, I think what you just said makes a lot of sense. I talked to a uh, retired cold case detective down in Baltimore several years ago and apprised him of, of, of the developments of this case. And he said, look, you know, these guys have such a backlog of these cold cases. Unless they find DNA, there's nothing they can do. Like with a case that old witnesses die, you know, unless there's a confession or something like that. So that certainly contributes to it. I, I, I can't discount the possibility that, of course, Gerald Stano and or Bundy, again, were among the 2,500 people interviewed back then, and they just obviously don't want that to come out into the public for obvious reasons. Mm. And uh, victim family members, now it said you inter- interviewed some of them. Uh, what's their opinion of this? It was tough. Um, I did speak with the parents of Susan briefly, but that was just sort of, that was before, I guess, the origins of infamy had been published, and they didn't want to talk about it. And the father was very nice. I then spoke with, on record, the uh, Elizabeth from Minnesota, her sister, um, and, and the contents of that are obviously in the book regarding um, Bundy. Uh, her parents had been apprised that Bundy uh, was a person of interest. Um, going back, uh, and you know, but she didn't really have any opinion as to as to whether or not he had he had killed the girls. The uh, Elizabeth's parents had died, so I never did get the chance to interview the father. In fact, the father was only alive for a few weeks during the time when I had tried to interview him, and that's how I had contacted the sister. So. I always want to tread lightly when it comes to victim family members because I just can't imagine the horror that they've gone through. Mm. Um, any big surprises when you were doing the research? Uh, not nah, real big surprises that I can think of other than the, the, the coincidences between the suspects in Pennsylvania that hadn't been, been made public. Really, the geographic proximity. If one of the suspects you know, lived a mile from Gerald Stano. So Gerald Stano lived a little under four miles from Ted Bundy, so you had this strange sort of Bermuda triangle of suspects um, that I just absolutely, I had no idea that that had occurred. I had no idea that Gerald Stano had known one of the suspects in 1969. And you have to think, you know, maybe they knew one another, did one another, did know one another, and you know, that gave rise to to their uh, confessions later on. They didn't just dream them up out of thin air, and especially Bundy. I mean, no one asked him, as far as I can tell, you know, point blank. Uh, you know, let's talk about the Garden State Parkway murders. He brought he brought up his association with with Ocean City unsolicited on two separate occasions to two separate defense psychologists. So that that's just fascinating to me and, and again when I researched that further and saw the connection with, with Stano and, and the fact that Stano had known one of the suspects and that Stano's younger brother had in fact been at the beach in question by the state police uh, I just was very surprised and, and, and taken aback by that hmm. Were there a lot of other people that uh, was this type of crime going on in, in the Garden um, Park area um, was there other girls that were found dead or anything around that time? 
No. Um, the, a, the, a year later, a girl was found underneath the pier. Hunt's Pier was called in Wildwood, New Jersey, about 15 miles south of Ocean City, and she had, it, it was all the, you know, the gruesome markings of a serial killer as well. Uh, she had been strangled with an electrical wire, and sand had been stuffed down her throat, and her, let's just say the signature was um, a bow had been tied around her private area. Um, the police in the Garden, the New Jersey State Police, did in fact go and try to ascertain a connection between the murder. Her name was Carol Hill, and Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry didn't find any. Years later, uh, there were a number of murders up in North Jersey um, uh, along the parkway that I mapped out and did include in the book as well, several unsolved murders. Um, and when I looked on them on a map where the body was found, they were all along the northern stretch of the parkway. So you start to think, well, maybe there was a serial killer just going up and down the highway in New Jersey. Um, since publication, um, Richard Cottingham, with whom I uh, communicated while, uh, corresponded with while he was in, well, still is in jail, um, has confessed to, I think, three of those murders up in North Jersey. One of another, no, who's the other guy? Robert Zerinsky. Uh, DNA connected him to a Parkway murder up in North Jersey as well. So I, of course, uh, did a b brief biography of him in the back of the book. Um, I've got about five or six other, not persons that I know the police would have interviewed, but based upon their MOs and the fact that they were in the area at the time, um, obviously would, would be good suspects for the murder of Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry. Hmm. Richard Cottingham. Um, so you actually um, uh, got correspondence with him, didn't you? Yeah, I wrote him um, just on a lark and, and didn't think anything of it until about four months later. And he sends me back this one-page response, you know, with the return address, the New Jersey, New Jersey State Prison. And he wrote single space like it was a corona typewriter. And he said, I understand that... Um, you know, you're investigating the murders of these girls, and you want to know if I did them, because that's what I had written them. Did you kill Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry? I don't know. He said, in order for me to answer questions, he said, first of all, I didn't kill those girls, but I will tell you, I think it was either the person who did it or the type of person who did it. In order to do that, you need to give me a send to the prison a $250 food package and I also need you to give me, or I'm going to give you a dollar so our communication becomes confidential. Um, you say you're a lawyer, but I need to know you're not a cop, because a cop would be too cheap to spend $250. <laughs> I'm too cheap, too. I'm not yeah. going to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, the high-priced lawyer? God, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> give me some money. Yeah. Well, you know, it's tough. Uh, you know, and on top of which, I'm like... Hey, He's, this guy's supposed to be so smart. Like, why would you, why would I, why would you, you know I'm writing a book, so why would I accept a dollar from you in any communication we had would be, you know, obviously covered under attorney-client confidentiality. I couldn't use it anyway. So what would be the point of the trip down there? Yeah, yeah. Well, he just wanted to see you. The attention, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's all about that. I, I think that's kind of with a lot of them. Um, I, a lot of the ones I've I've been in touch with and had letters from, it's it's all about them. So uh, it's very seldom anything else. So that's how it is. Well, it's interesting also, the uh, everyone talks about sociopaths nowadays. The sociopath next door, and it's always struck me. I don't know about you guys, but you know, I think by definition you really don't know a sociopath until after the fact, because they're so good at masking you know, their, their identity and what they're really about. About the time when I had learned uh, or read of uh, Richard Larson's um, belief that Bundy had killed these two girls, I was working in an office right out of college. There was a guy in there named Paul Serio. And I had been there a few days and had this desk by these filing cabinets, and Paul made a point of coming over to me and said, Hi, Christian. Nice to meet you. This is a great company, yada, yada. He was in a tie, and the only thing that struck me as peculiar, he had these medieval pewter jousting rings on his hands. Apparently, that was the scoop about him. On weekends, he would be engaged in that those Renaissance fairs. 
So I'd say hi to him all the time. My friend would call him sandwiches because he would, Paul would eat these sandwiches and fall asleep at his desk. So about two years later, uh, you know, it, it, well, I'm at another company, and my friend calls me. He says, guess what? I'm like, what's up? He says, sandwiches, you remember him? I'm like, of course. Sandwiches appeared on America's Most Wanted. So the guy who was on my desk <laughs> offering to help me organize my files had, in fact, murdered a housewife in Florida along with another guy. He was a hitman had strangled her with a telephone cord and, and put a knife in her chest. I didn't know it at the time. In retrospect, I can tell you, there was nothing about this guy that seemed out of sorts, other than the fact they said, well, he had eight wives and he had these rings, but completely, completely normal, nice person. You never mm -hmm. knew. Yeah, I think that's quite often. I think the problem with the uh, true crime has become a big um you know, big big obsession with a lot of people, and so what happens is you just get a lot of general terms, and people throw them around, but they don't really know how to use them. So, but right. you know, you know. Um, so, and I don't want to get hate mail in case people don't like that. Just um, send it to uh, um, I don't know. Kristen will take them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, is, uh, what do you got next? planned are you going to continue this uh, or contemplating you... a few things there's a couple of unsolved crimes i'm, I'm looking into um writing a book about that uh, basically it you know um mm -hmm. nothing nothing that's too exciting that i can really think of offhand uh contemplating obviously doing a doing a podcast uh, along those lines but um, nothing concrete at this point yeah yeah well you know everyone's got one you gotta have one too the <laughs> Oh, uh, you got a website? I don't have a website. You could go on wildbluepress.com. My biography is on there. Um, if you want to buy the book, it's obviously called The Garden State Park Remurders on Amazon. It's also for sale at a terrific independent bookstore in Ocean City um, called Sunrose Words and Music on Asbury Avenue. Nancy Miller, the owner, has been beyond selfless uh, in her help you get a lot of people from the community i've noticed on facebook that i've put copies of the book um, requesting people to talk about it on these subgroups and, and really getting a, a ton of response and a lot of concern and you get a lot of community support people say how can i help i remember those killings and you get people like nancy you know pushing the book and, and talking about it and really trying to get started so Oh, it's nice. Yeah, it's great. Um, well, fantastic. Um, we will put the book on our website as well, so people listening can just hit one click and pick up the book. Uh, okay. Really, really recommend it. Um, our guest today has been Christian uh, Barth, and we've been talking about the book uh, he just released in January called The Garden State Parkway Murders. It's a cold case mystery. Thank you for being on the show, Christian. Thanks, guys. I greatly appreciate it. Had a lot of good time. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.